Last couple days I've been sick, so I was making the last video and uh, I was starting to get strep throat. I managed to get through and like I sang okay and I can actually still sing just fine. Like the way I sing is like not affecting the area at all, which is cool. Um, the, the sore throat's pretty much gone though. I went on antibiotics and getting better. I'm still a little like bleh though. So I'm gonna try and get through this, but I was uh, sick of being sick. So <laughs> since you're right, I'm gonna come out and make one of these, which uh, this is original Christian rock and I'm about to just start writing a song. So I was playing this F major with the open G string in it. And I also have the major seven there. Just sounds nice. And then I was just gonna jump to this A minor seven, so that'll probably be the verse. Yeah, I'd do something like that for a chorus. Just kind of didn't even have that per se, but went right into it. So I think that'll be it. <laughs> so verse, chorus, super easy. I'm just going to play through this and uh, get things rolling here. Okay, I got through the uh, left side. My headphones still in. So I'm gonna do the right side. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention it earlier. This drum loop, it's uh, going bye bye <laughs> after I, uh, you know, get done with this. Cause I'll sit down and play a real drum part. But this is just to keep time for now. I think I am gonna do some overdubs, so this will be a left side verse. I'll just do Pays the ball, and I'll go do that for the first chord. Down for the second chord. You know, A minor. Um then the chorus, I'll probably do octaves, like doubled octaves. Just to harmonize with the chords. So here goes. I'm gonna do a right side. I don't even know what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna improvise some stuff, so here we go. So the guitar solo is next. Um, yeah, this part's just C major, A minor, I don't know, however you want to look at it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do the bass part. I'm gonna start tracking the drums now. Um, after I turned off the camera, I made this uh, MIDI part. It's just a bunch of arpeggio stuff, so it sounds like this. The 
point of that is just underneath background stuff to just make it sound cooler. I'm kind of into it right now, so I keep doing it. It's an arpeggiator. You just plug in the notes of the chords, and there it is. So that's what I did. Drums now. I'll sit down and start tracking those, and then I'll be back and maybe do vocals. I'll test out my voice and see if I can actually sing, but I'm not sure. Um, I think I can, like, no problem as far as, like, you know, actually singing, singing, but I uh, just don't know if it's going to, like... You know, strep throat, there's a little bit of, like, mangled stuff back there now, so I don't know if it'll, like, tickle and make me cough, but we'll see. Well, this might be ill-advised, but I'm gonna try and sing this. I'm gonna break it up, so I just do the verse, and then I'll do the chorus afterwards. That way I don't have to like try and plow all the way through this thing. Um, this is really gonna be me focusing on my technique, though, because singing absolutely correctly, this shouldn't do any like damage at all, but if I start to go a little crappy on my technique, it's gonna hurt. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to just pay attention, and I'm just gonna do it. And Are you laughing? I got through the verse. Um, I'll have to see if my voice sounds any different, but I think I hit the notes. <laughs> That's saying something. I'm going to do the chorus part now. It's actually good that I separated them because uh, I totally forgot the chorus melody until I turned on my scratch track here. I got that blocked out. I warm up and come up with the melody, and then I leave it there for reference. It this time it was a good idea. Um, okay, though, chorus part. Um, I did a couple screamy things, which uh, if you're wondering whether that hurts or not, no. It's a uh, fry. So it's like vocal fry. If you wake up in the morning and you have that kind of like wah sound when you talk, you learn to do that over any note. And then I can just barely audibly do like a falsetto or whatnot and just, or like a mixed voice type thing and then just do the vocal fry over it. it sounds like I'm screaming my head off. But in the room, it just sounds make, like I'm making a stupid noise under my breath. It's super easy, doesn't hurt at all. But the compression on the microphone and a little bit of reverb makes all the difference. And when it's it squishes that volume flat. It gives the illusion that you're screaming, even though you're absolutely not. So it's totally painless, really simple. And if you were standing next to me, you would just be like, why are you making that noise, dude? <laughs> but here it sounds a little bit like a scream. So anyway, don't worry if you heard that thinking I got strep throat and you're like, oh my God, what are you doing? <laughs> so nah, it's fine. Um, Anyway, in the description box, you're going to find the lyrics. It's always about my Christian faith in some way, shape, or form. Um, don't read too in-depth in my lyrics and try and get too much meaning, though, because I just, you know, write down stuff quick. <laughs> it's like that general idea, but I do view my music as like a way to say thanks and give back to God and say, uh, or I guess just give him praises, why not? Above that, though, above the lyrics, that is, you're going to see a bunch of places where you can purchase and stream my music, the typical online retailers, and then above that, Pastor Melissa Scott, which I put that in there because that is the main place that I go. I find it to be the best teaching anywhere. I'm sure there's some little pocket somewhere, some unknown place that doesn't have internet connection where they're, you know, doing also really good Bible teaching, but they don't have an online presence. <laughs> so most of the places that do, um, and even just local churches, wherever you go, they always have these really weird ideas and they have a bunch of, actually, hang on. They have a bunch of like subjective things that they bring in. So their own ideologies and theology that they make up on their own based on certain people's anal analysis of whatever. And they come in and they try and superimpose that onto what the Bible says. That ain't Christianity. <laughs> um, I mean, it is a name, but Christianity is just focused on Jesus and what he did on that cross to redeem us. It's preeminent, um, yeah, prevenient, sorry, so the wrong word, prevenient grace. That's the word you're looking for. Um, and that actually is before we even existed, God called our names out and we're forgiven. So when Jesus came down and 
paid for all of our sins. God forgave us. All of our sins are wiped clear. We're, you know, we're free from the law. The law of Moses, if you could meet the standard of that law, then you could live by it. But no one can meet the standard of the law. It's impossible for us. The whole point of it is just a schoolmaster to teach us that we fall short. A lot of people miss that. They'll uh, pick out a certain category of sinners that they want to focus on. And they're like, oh, these people do this, they do this, they do this. And it's the typical groups you could think of. Problem is, we're all sinners. There's no category. All of us. All of us fall short. Every single one. So if you're looking at that other person and saying you're a sinner, um, so are you. <laughs> so what's your point? You're looking at the other person and saying the stuff on them stinks worse than the stuff on you, but you both have stuff on you. This church is teaching faith in Christ that he paid for all of our sins, that we are forgiven. God has forgiven us. We're at peace with God. God's at peace with us. It's cessation of againstness. That's, you know, what peace is. Faith is... It's a little difficult to actually uh, describe what this is, because like if you go from the actual Greek, it's pistis. It's usually a verb, and the noun form is actually even a higher form of faith, but seldom used. But the verb form is um, ongoing and continuous, and it's an action verb. When you're sealed with the Holy Spirit in Romans, it's an action verb that they're talking about when they say faith, and it's an ongoing and continuous process. So you are ongoing and continually in the process of being saved as you continue in faith. If you don't continue to faith, then you are no longer meeting that criteria. So the one saved, always saved guys, they're making a huge mistake because they're going by the English word faith, which is a noun, and they're screwing it all up. And belief in the King James that showed up there, just linguistically, that was like a new word and doesn't really cover it. It's ongoing, continuous action. And it's not action as in works, but action as in faith itself is the action. So you see an obstacle coming at you. And rather than being scared off by the obstacle, you act on the belief in God's word that God's word is higher, sustained by confidence because you are confidently faithing and believing in, I, I know there's a belief component in faith. It's kind of confusing, but <laughs> it's action based upon belief sustained by confidence. So it's the confidence that God's word continues to be true. So easiest way to look at it, children of Israel coming out of Egypt, they keep getting met with circumstances that scare them. And every time they see the circumstance, they get scared away and they want to go back to Egypt and they say, oh, we should have died, you know, back in Egypt. We're going to die here in the wilderness. Of course, that makes no sense because what does it matter where you die? But <laughs> they don't get that God's word and what God can do is higher than the circumstance you're seeing. So no matter what the circumstance looks like, you hold on to the promises of God. That's acting in faith. So you have a promise, you grab onto it and you don't let go. That's how you act in faith. You have to realize that a lot of the, like, say, like fundamentalist Christians, and various other things, they kind of portray a God that looks scary. But in fact, God is loving, forgiving, and super long-suffering. Like, he puts up with a lot of stuff from us. So it's completely the opposite of what they're thinking. Now, you just have to have faith. You continue on in it. That's it. It's not like a behavior change. It's not putting on a certain appearance. It's not acting a certain way. It's just faithing and trusting in God. The other stuff, that'll come... Because God is going to put the Holy Spirit in you, and when you have the whole, or when you have the Holy Spirit, because you're continually acting in faith, God will start changing you. And once God starts changing you, then that's actual, real change brought on by God, not the fake stuff you usually see. Because a lot of people, they're just putting on airs, they're faking. I, I don't know what they get out of it, but I guess they think they look important. But the things that are actually going to come out of you when you have the Holy Spirit working in you are a lot different than what you see. And it's a spirit of giving, it's a spirit of love, and it's a spirit of forgiveness. And, you know, there's maybe even a little more to it than that, but the love is agape love, highest form of love, unconditional, has an element of giving without expectation of return. Forgiving, you forgive because God forgave you, and you're not to judge other people because the measure by which you judge, that you will be judged. So don't judge other people. So super judgy people that say they're Christians, uh, they're kind of doing themselves a disservice there. On top of that, the giving thing, that's a really important thing to God. Giving is super overlooked by almost every church, except the one I have at the end of the link. And they do a lot of teaching on it, which is really good because they're bringing it back to what it should be all the way through the Bible. Even the tree in the Garden of Eden was a form of this. It's like God's right to say, this is mine. Don't touch off limits. They just have one thing <laughs> and they, they did it anyway. The very first thing after that, you have them trying to cover themselves up and God instead shows that with sin comes death and he, rather than the 
fig leaves they cover themselves with, slays an animal, gives them the skins, shows them what death is, and shows that blood is the only way you can make atonement for death. After that, you have Cain and Abel. It's overgiving. They were coming to a spot, presenting their offerings. Abel did it the right way. He brought a sacrifice, not done of his own hands. It was uh, blood for sin because the life is in the blood. That's why it's that way. Cain did it wrong, tried to do it on his own, didn't do it God's way. So it's giving God's way. You have Abraham. He gave tithes to Melchizedek, 10th of what he had. Um, Moses coming down off the mountain. What's the first thing he said? <laughs> Take up an offering. Or God told him to say to the people, Take up an offering. Super important. It's all the way through. I could keep going. Like every single thing, there's giving all the way through the Bible. The table of showbread in the law, they were gathering the manna, 12 tribes, 12 loaves they would bake, they would put on top of that table. And that was them giving back to God out of what he provided for them. So God doesn't have any needs. It's not because God has needs. God to be God has no needs, but he wants us to have that element of giving that he has. He gave his only son. He wants us to also have that characteristic. So that's one he's going to give you. So yeah, right there, table of showbread. Most commentaries will say it's the type of Christ. The Ark of the Covenant is the type of Christ. Table of showbread is us giving back to God. And if you look, God God lists the things that are more important to him first, and usually the thing he lists last, that's actually what we need, which is like, say, like the trespass offering. But first thing, Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, it's right up there and huge major importance thing. Most people will say like, oh, prayer and that sort of thing. That's like um, the altar of incense. That's barely even mentioned first. So it's you recognizing God recognizing his authority and giving back because of that spirit of giving. And I could skip a whole bunch of things, but it's in Ma it's mentioned in Malachi and uh, God explaining that they robbed him in tithes and offerings because they didn't have that right spirit of giving and they weren't doing it the right way. They were putting on airs like they were, but they were not. In the New Testament, though, Paul explains that in order to give in the New Testament, you simply just give to the teacher who taught you in the word. So it's recognition of God's authority because you're saying, I value God's word over the money I have, and I realize that God can provide me everything I need, so I don't have to hold on to this. The first Christians, if you want to get technical and be like all legalistic and say, oh, the tithe is the law, like a lot of people do. Well, the first Christians gave everything, and uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they dropped dead because they didn't, and they lied about it. I actually think, had they not lied, they probably would have been fine, but maybe, maybe not, because it was kind of like, they also kind of gave us like the first fruits. That's why they gave everything. If you're going to complain about, say, like a tithe, um, you could do it totally New Testament style and give everything. So, you know, shut up. <laughs> um, it's usually just the people who don't have that spirit of giving that are going to complain about it. It's not something that can be commanded, though, and it's not something that is going to be coerced. A lot of churches will do things where they'll put up some kind of charitable thing or they're showing you where the money's going or they're doing this and that and uh, they're showing you pictures of like hungry kids and sad puppy dogs and trying to get you to have an emotional response. Well, charity, Judas wanted to do it that way when the woman with the alabaster box gave all she had to Jesus, her precious ointment. He said, why couldn't we sell this and give it to charity? That's what most churches do. They do it the Judas way. Charity is fine. Charity is even built into the law, but if you want to go Old Testament and use that as the schoolmaster, but it's not nearly as important as the burnt offering. And Paul says the equivalent in the New Testament of the burnt offering is giving to the teacher who taught you in the word. Check out Galatians 6.6. 6. It's right there. On top of that, though, the teaching is just a lot of really cool stuff because they go into the original languages. And uh, I really like that because a lot of people say, oh, this Bible version versus this Bible version. Every English translation and or other language is going to have some form of transmission error because you're going one language to the other. So you're either going to have a thing where they're going to try and like convey the ideas or convey literal accuracy, one for one translation for each word. Either way, it kind of garbles it up and some kind of go like half and half. But you're always going to miss something. The Greek is super precise and you're just not going to get it right. The Hebrew is a little bit vague and there's certain like idioms that are used a lot. One I think would be like translated like out of the mist and that's like uh, what you'd even see for like someone being raptured somewhere and uh, that's one rapture is not actually in the Bible but it's a word that's commonly used. Um, it's from the Latin raptero and or I'm pronouncing that terribly but it's actually the Greek word harpazo which is almost like from harpooning. So it's like suddenly with force going, psh, psh, pulling someone out. That's actually used quite often. Um, anyway, cool things with the language like that or the pistis thing I said with faith. There's like two groups I always see like when I'm just like, you know, trying to look up stuff and I get bombarded by it. And it'll be like either one saved, always saved guys or these guys that are all like works. And I'm like, you're both wrong. Because <laughs> one, it's not 
once saved, always saved. It's a continuing process. That's why the parable of the sower is saying what it is. And that's why Paul is talking about putting on the whole armor because it's a process and you need to put on that whole armor so you can stand against what's going to be thrown at you as you're continuing to grow in faith. And the works guys got it wrong because you're not saved by works. So what is it? It's ongoing, continuous continuous faith that you keep going and developing a relationship with God. Once saved, always saved is basically, well, I showed up, I said my vows, and then I and then I peaced out. <laughs> Met up with some other girl and, you know, we're living in Vegas and uh, screw my wife. And then the works thing is basically, I wrote up this marriage contract and I'm going to do it and say these things at this exact same time every time and every, you know, at every point and every day. But what God's looking for is a good relationship built on trust and love and faith. So that right there <laughs> is a good, you know, way to look at it. But hey, whatever. Some people just don't get it. Um, anyway, though, check out the link. It's really good teaching. Um, I'm probably going on a little bit long here today, so I'm going to shut up. I'll get this thing out, and uh, I'm going to go in and eat some stuff. <laughs> I'm a bit hungry. And uh, just rest so I don't get sick again. All right, later. Yeah,